it was not until the bitter end did Ted Bundy... As the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez... Diane Wilder. Bianchi has also been charged separately in Los Angeles. from where Scott Peterson says he went fishing the day Lacey disappeared. He gave me what no man has ever given me before. It's been a whole f- story all along the way. He really was taking all control of my life and my actions. The possible execution of him always is in the back of your mind. What do these women have in common? They fell hard for men doing hard time. One was a rapist, the others sadistic killers. Have women tried to contact Scott Peterson? Uh, they have. He's actually gotten wedding proposals, letters, phone calls, even before he arrived to San Quentin. These are women who feel guilty for their own erotic impulses. This is not a process where a woman is rational and says, well, I think I'm going to go and have a relationship with a convicted murderer. In the next two hours, we'll blow the lid off an issue that's as disturbing as it is controversial. He projected himself as this warm and lovable, likable person, and he had chosen to crush my father's skull. I was very angry that he should be up on the internet trying to engage women when my husband was dead. Even the most hardened criminals are free to find love online, and it's happening in record numbers. I would warn anybody, you don't want to be coming into this environment arbitrarily distrusting, and I would tell people to be very leery. We'll also check out women on the inside looking out. There's the infamous, like Susan Smith. She drowned her two young kids. We estimate that she received over 6,000 email forwards alone, and that was in a 72-hour period. And there are the anonymous, like these women. They also committed murder. I have nothing but time, so I could dedicate all my time to being there for that person. Yes, it does get lonely, but the mail that, that comes in takes me to the outside for that, for that while. The emotions are raw. I told you guys I didn't do it. The people, real. I didn't have any choice but to shoot him, so I shot him. Their stories, riveting. This one I don't know about. This one I killed. And one story you'll never forget. I agreed ultimately to go kill someone, to um, commit his identical crime. True Hollywood Story investigates Love Behind Bars right now. Now, from inside the walls of California's San Quentin prison, the host of THS Investigates, Samantha Harris. Just a few feet behind me sits Scott Peterson, right here on death row. Peterson arrived in mid-March 2005 after he was convicted of killing his pregnant wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. Despite his horrific crime, Inmate number V72100 receives bags of fan mail, including love letters and even marriage proposals. I don't care what people think of me. The Peterson tragedy consumed the media and captivated a nation. Days away from knowing whether the remains discovered off the shores of Point Isabel in Richmond. There are no words that can possibly describe the ache in my heart or the emptiness in my life. I had no reason not to trust him. I had nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance. Ironically, Peterson awaits execution only a few miles from where he dumped Lacey's body into San Francisco Bay. Scott Peterson is the current example of a high-profile killer who is an ideal target for prison groupies because he is good-looking. Um, he never admitted that he killed his wife. Those inmates that are given this mystique by being assigned the death sentence 
has a large, large following, particularly from the female community. For uh, a woman coming into this environment, uh, it's like stepping into the ultimate reality show. It's, it's, it's honest, unadulterated, stark emotion. It can be groupies for rock stars, groupie for athletes, uh, as well as law enforcement, or I love an outlaw. In fact, many seemingly ordinary women are ready to risk everything, including their lives, to connect with condemned thieves, rapists, even murderers. As far as women uh, pursuing men in prison, you know, there's just that type of women. I'm sure some women are fascinated with the uh, type of person that they perceive comes to prison and commits crimes. And, and I don't think it's any secret that there are some women that are attracted to that. Author Sheila Eisenberg wrote Women Who Love Men Who Kill. In researching the book, Eisenberg probed into the hearts and minds of serial killer groupies who fixated on infamous murderers. Among them, Ted Bundy and Night Stalker Richard Ramirez. I think that women are motivated sometimes because they're lonely and they just want someone to correspond with. Uh, other times because the killers are, quote, bad boys. It's a melodrama. And by hooking into his life, you are sharing with that melodrama. In 1975, Marvin Mutch was convicted of first-degree murder in the death of a 13-year-old girl in Union City, California. Over the years, he has seen plenty of women seek love behind bars. A lot of people think it's uh, a natural inclination uh, that uh, women may have in uh, rescuing somebody or uh, restoring somebody who's damaged. Then other people believe you come in here and you have an exclusive access to this person. But why get involved with someone serving a life sentence, or worse, facing execution? Well, I can meet someone who has cancer and has terminal cancer and fall in love with them, and that wouldn't change my mind about loving that person and wanting to be with that person until the end. To me, that's the same difference. Brian Smith was sent away for life at 18 after committing a gang-related murder in the early 1980s. Smith has been behind bars for nearly 25 years. I'll tell you, it takes a very strong woman to come in here and maintain a relationship because it's not always uh, fun coming in to visit people in prison. There's a lot they have to go through. But for women driven by romantic fantasy and sexual obsession, no wall is too high, no danger too real. There is a great sensuality connected with someone who has committed a violent act. And a lot of times these are women who feel guilty for their own erotic impulses. And uh, this is a way to, in a sense, be punished because of the feeling that when the men get out, they could actually become their next victims. But it's not just about female fantasies. Some men prefer women with a very dark side. On Christmas morning 2000, Stephanie Barron shot her parents in the head in their Tyler, Texas home. Why? Because they allegedly didn't like her boyfriend. Barron was just 17 at the time, and she got life in prison. The fan letters started arriving right away. The mail that, that comes in, it's, it's a boost. You know, it, it takes me to the outside for that, for that while, and I have to offer a listening ear, you know, I can, I can be there for them. I feel like I'm a very loving person and caring and I can offer my friendship, you know, and if something leads to more ever than it will, you know, whatever happens will happen. Stephanie's best friend at Gatesville Correctional is 26-year-old Tracy Aguilera. Aguilera was sentenced to life in prison for robbing and stabbing to death an elderly man in 1999. Aguilera's putting it out there that she's available, sort of. The only thing that I have to offer them would be, I mean myself, the woman that I am today, is I can't offer you really anything physically. I can offer you support mentally and emotionally, you know, and I mean just hard to say it's like I mean 
I can be there for them in a lot of ways that, you know, I, I have nothing but time. So I could dedicate all my time to being there for that person. For Tracy, gender is irrelevant. I feel like if you connect some, with someone, whether it be male or female, you know, I mean, it, it really doesn't matter to me. It's, it's that, like I said, it, it's a connection. You know, it's, you, you can just feel it. You know, and I mean, it, it doesn't matter to me the, the sexual preference or religion or, or whatever. When we come back, we'll meet a woman whose lust for a notorious serial killer led her down a very bizarre path. I felt sorry for my thought. Here's this poor innocent guy trapped in this body that a monster takes over once in a while. And later, do these killers deserve love? He beat my husband to death for no reason except that he wanted his car and his money. For nearly every thief, rapist, or murderer who's locked up for life or sentenced to death, there's a woman on the outside willing to do anything for her man even kill. You're about to meet a woman who fell into this terrible trap. Her story is powerful, and so is her message. I am a whole person, a good person, one who's very remorseful of her crime and would do anything to take it back. By me giving this interview, hopefully it'll help other people that are out there that are considering getting involved with people incarcerated. Veronica Lynn Barrera grew up in a devout Catholic family in San Jose, California, but things changed. By age 11, Veronica's parents were divorced and she hit the road, a desperate and lonely child. I was rebelling and uh, had no idea what was in store for me. She quickly found out. Veronica says that while hitchhiking in 1967, she was abducted by two men. They held her captive for eight months, repeatedly raping her. When I was finally able to escape um, and I got to a police station, uh, the police notified my father and he came and picked me up. He tried to get me help um, with a psychologist and they tried to do as much as they could because I didn't talk. Um, the trauma was pretty severe. For years after the ordeal, Veronica struggled with her memories and emotions. She turned 18 in September 1974, but there was little to celebrate thanks to Veronica's father. He came from a Hispanic culture and he arranged a marriage for me. And it was a very nice man, but it was not a marriage of love. The marriage to Jeff Compton collapsed after two years. Veronica retained her married name and split for Hollywood. She studied acting, dabbled in playwriting, and did drugs. We had wild, wild times and, you know, people having kilos of cocaine and I would go to the parties and we would just be doing cocaine for a couple of days at a time. Partying, really hard partying. Between coke binges, Veronica started writing a weird theater piece. I'm starting to do another play, The Mutilated Cutter. Um, which was radical, revolutionary. It was of a female serial killer. In 1977, a real serial killer began terrorizing the city of Angels. The Los Angeles Police Department plans to beef up the special task force assigned to the investigation of the series of strangulation murders, as many as 40 working on the case by tomorrow. They're also beefing up the police patrols in the area where the bodies have been found. I'm so scared. Now I'm, now I'm more worried than ever. Over a four-month period, the bodies of 10 women were found in the hills above Los Angeles. The cops labeled the killer the Hillside Strangler. They were all found nude, lying near a roadside, all within a four to five mile area radius and that they had all been sexually molested and that they all died as a means of strangulation. We were all terrified women. On January 14, 1979, the story took an unexpected twist. 
Bob Knudsen, a Washington State police detective, was called to a remote area in Bellingham. The strangled bodies of two college women were found in an abandoned vehicle. Probably the easiest way to describe it, they were thrown in the back like a couple of sacks of spuds. They just tossed in. Police found a note written by one of the victims. It read, Ken, 7 p.m., 234 Bayside. Later that day, police arrested 28-year-old security guard Kenneth Bianchi. We tied the car to Ken, and, and the, the bodies were tied to Ken with pubic hair. The cops later connected Bianchi to the murders in Los Angeles. Whoever had done this had done it before because the car had been wiped, uh, everything was so clean and so neat that this was an experienced killer, which is somewhat scary. This morning we have filed felony charges against Kenneth Alessio Bianchi in connection with the murders of five of what have been termed as Hillside Strangler victims. And he's been named in a felony complaint charging five counts of murder, one count of sodomy, one count of conspiracy to commit murder, kidnapping and rape. Bianchi confessed to five of the L.A. murders and both murders in Washington. This one I killed. These two I don't know about. This one I don't know about. This one I killed. This was the first one I killed. Bianchi also snitched on his cousin and partner in crime, Angelo Bono. He's my kind of man. Okay. There should be more people in the world like Angelo. All right. They tortured before they, they killed them. They injected them with lye and just household things they had around in the house. And they just wanted to see what would happen to them. Uh, one of the women, they took a, an electric cord and uh, just plugged her into that, uh, stripped the ends just to see uh, what the electricity did to her. And so they were really, uh, it was really torture that, that they were doing to these people. So there were some very graphic, very troubling things. Bianchi escaped the death penalty by agreeing to help prosecutors build a case against Angelo Bono. Bianchi got life in prison without parole, so did Bono. Enter 23-year-old Veronica Compton. Veronica wrote to Bianchi in early 1980 while researching her play about a serial killer. I told him I felt sympathetic for his situation because at the time, he led us to believe that he was a good guy. Bianchi's charm was nothing but a con. Veronica knew the 28-year-old drifter and his cousin not only killed their victims, they raped and tortured them first. Still, she blindly took the leap. I was trying to entice him to let me have this interview. You know, it would be a big coup for my career. You know, the cutthroat young girl thinking I was going to make my mark. Veronica was naive and beautiful. Bianchi had nothing to lose. We started talking through the phone because he said that he's not allowed to have a direct interview. Um, they're screening all of his visitors and so forth. What he projects to me at the time is a young man who is articulate, who is thoughtful, who is completely innocent of a crime. Bianchi quickly took control. He started asking me questions, all these intimate details. All I'm noticing is that I am becoming um, more attached to this person um, because there's so many similarities. Veronica's conversations with Bianchi became more personal and more frequent. Now he is calling me every day, um, checking in on me, seeing what I ate. Did I sleep well? Who did I see? It's just amazing. You can actually get stalked by people that are locked up. Then came the invitation to meet. He finally was able to get me cleared to go visit him. So now I go to the jail and we meet face to face. I was not attracted to him, but there was something very charismatic about him. Bianchi tried to convince Veronica he was innocent, and in time, she believed him. It was his cousin that had committed the crimes and set him up, and the only reason that he said that he committed the crimes was because if he didn't, he would get killed. Then Bianchi pushed Veronica to do the unthinkable. And I agreed ultimately to do a crime that I was completely against. The plan was to make it look like the real killer was on the loose. and. He wanted me to go kill someone, to um, 
commit his identical crime. Bianchi laid out every detail of his crazy scheme. She had supposed to have a uh, syringe with semen from somebody else in it, and once she had killed the person, she was to inject the semen into the uh, vagina of the victim, and thereby proving that Ken couldn't have done it. Veronica was trapped in a horrifying nightmare. I felt he was in complete control of my life at that point. I felt like I was an automaton, like he, he really was taking all control of my life and my actions. Was I in love with him? Hell no, I hated him at that point. But it's so insane for me to try to explain this to someone. How can you absolutely hate someone and yet give them com complete control of your life um, and do something so awful? Bianchi's hold on Veronica grew. On September 19th, 1980, Veronica flew to Bellingham, Washington, prepared to kill. That same day, 25-year-old cocktail waitress Kim Breed stopped by the Coconut Grove Lounge to pick up her paycheck. Veronica soon showed up, she ordered a drink, and the two women started to talk. She says, well, I'm in from California, and she brought attention to the fact she was pregnant and um, said that uh, she's not with the father anymore, that she's going to raise the child alone. And I felt, you know, a lot of empathy for her because I was raising two young children by myself. You know, I felt some sort of bond that I almost felt like I wanted to help her. Veronica wasn't really pregnant. She fastened a stage prop around her waist and wore a blonde wig as a disguise. Kim and Veronica spent the day together. That night, they returned to the Coconut Grove. This is the tavern where uh, Veronica Compton and her victim originally met, uh, drank, and, and uh, got to know each other. I get to the bar, and I meet my boyfriend, and it's suddenly she wants to go. She has to go back to her, uh, her motel room. And would I please give her a ride? Kim Breed had no idea what the next few hours would bring. Coming up, an ordeal so terrifying it's hard to imagine. I realized at that moment that I was going to die, that this was no game. Welcome back to THS Investigates and the shocking story of Veronica Compton. At 23, Veronica became obsessed with convicted serial killer Kenneth Bianchi. Bianchi persuaded Veronica to commit a copycat murder in the hopes of clearing his name. It didn't exactly go as planned. The Shangri-La Motel just off of Holly Street in Bellingham, Washington. And this is the place where Veronica Compton uh, lured her victim to a motel room right over here. Moments after Veronica and cocktail waitress Kim Breed arrived at the Shangri-La, Compton moved in for the kill. She was saying something about this game that she plays. So she had my hands tied behind my back and she put the rope around my neck. And um, the next thing I recall is she's shoving me down on the bed. She jumps on my back. She's tightens the rope, and she's got her knees on me. I assaulted her and tried to choke her. I realized at that moment that I was going to die, that this was no game. Came very close, very close to a homicide, probably within 30, 45 seconds. I rolled and threw her off of me, and she went flying to the floor, and I jumped up, and you know, I got my, worked my hands out of the, the, the ties, and I, you know, I proceeded to ask her, you know, what the hell do you think you're doing? Are you crazy? Veronica says she suddenly snapped back to reality. I was sobbing at her feet, begging her to forgive me. And she knelt beside me and tried to comfort me and said, why did you do this? And I said, I did it for a man. 
She's screaming in the corner. He made me do it. He made me do it. I couldn't help myself. I go to head for the door and she had locked it and I tried to unlock it and she came from behind me and put the rope around me again and tried to take me down again. Well, of course, and then my hands are free and I just pushed her away and I ran out, got my car. Kim was in shock. She didn't call the police until the next day. Based on Kim's description, Bellingham detectives quickly identified the lady strangler as Veronica Compton of Hollywood, California. The prosecutor sent two of us, two detectives, and we obtained a search warrant for the residents down in California. They came and arrested me at my home, and the police told me later, they said, you must have wanted to get arrested because you did everything you could to make sure we'd find you. And uh, they also said, we know that he put you up to this. Tell us the truth, you're the third woman that he's done this to. He said the other women didn't take it as far as you. We had her handwriting. Uh, she also did uh, make some statements that, uh, that were useful too. Uh, but she didn't admit, of course, she's trying to kill Kim. And so Veronica Compton faces the charge of attempting a copycat murder in Bellingham, Washington. That in order to discredit Kenneth Bianchi's Hillside Strangler confessions earlier this year. When and if the case comes to trial, an important point will be her relationship with Bianchi. Perhaps only then will we discover if Veronica Compton was trying to help a disturbed, unjustly convicted man or simply another one of his victims. Maybe I'm naive, but I think that the truth eventually comes out. She uh, basically didn't have much choice but to admit that it was connected to Ken Bianchi. She did all this under the influence of drugs and alcohol, and uh, she had fell in love with him. No, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy any of it. I told you guys I didn't do it. And isn't it true the only game you're playing is a game that you came here to play? That was to make everyone think that Kenneth Bianchi wasn't the person who killed both of the girls here. No, that's not what I had in mind at all. On October 2nd, 1980, Veronica Compton was convicted of attempted murder in the first degree. The judge gave Compton a life sentence with the possibility of parole. I thought she got what she deserved. I definitely believe that she deserved to spend a long time in jail. She was so beautiful and that she could be so crazy that she would throw her life away like that. It just didn't make any sense. Veronica had plenty of time to try to make sense of a senseless crime. It wasn't so much about spending the rest of my life there. That's the least of it when you do something like that. What you're trying to do is live with yourself. I don't forgive her because there's no reason to. She tried to take my life. She tried to take me from my children and my family and everything that was important to me. I've never been so ashamed of my life and hurt. And I'm so glad that I didn't kill her. I couldn't have lived with myself. You know, and I think by keeping me in prison, it kept me alive so I didn't kill myself. Compton says communication with the outside was crucial to surviving on the inside. Maybe I couldn't take back my crime, but if I could do some good things, maybe my life would have some meaning. And you can never take back hurting someone, <laughs> but you can um, work toward helping other people not be hurt and not get hurt. In prison, Compton wrote poetry. She also wrote a book about rehabilitating female inmates. It's based on years of research and surveys of the women incarcerated. It tells you about their history. It tells you about their needs. Veronica earned a law degree through the National Lawyers Guild and became a jailhouse activist. I had been very much involved in the prison system and changing policy and involved in lawsuits to try to make a prison more livable, uh, fairer for women than it had been. In 1987, Veronica read an article about theories of punishment written by a professor at the University of Washington. I was completely opposed to what he was espousing, 
I wrote an angry letter. Um, the editor uh, wound up sending the letter to him. He said, let me tell you, you don't know what you're talking about on that particular kind of an offense. And I dug down deeper and found uh, there was more to it than I'd thought. And we were sending letters on a more or less weekly basis. Then came the moment of truth. She said, why, why don't you come and visit? He came into the visit room, and here was this man that um, was wearing these thick, you know, glasses. Uh, she came out, she made absolutely no attempt uh, to be uh, romantically attractive. There was also the age difference. At 57, James was 26 years older than his pen pal. Veronica just isn't like most of the people you run across. And uh, she was extremely articulate and had opinions. There was none of that uh, sort of flirtatious fluttering of the feathers that uh, you usually see, you know, when you meet somebody. I knew that the position that we were both in was hopeless. But despite all that, I, um, I kind of let him know that I was uh, really grooving on him. But could there be a happy ending for Veronica and James? We'll find out later in our show. As for the Hillside Strangler, Kenneth Bianchi got married in 1989 to a woman he met through the mail at Washington State Penitentiary. When THS Investigates returns, looking for love in all the wrong places. If we receive a new photo in the mail, we'll send it back and request a more appropriate one. Profile killers like Scott Peterson and Ken Bianchi grab the most headlines and the most fan mail, from the curious to the obsessed. But what about the not so famous inmates? How do they connect with the outside world? I thought that the best way to get exposure was to get on the internet and see who would contact me. <laughs> In January 1996, Quentin Smith killed a man. We are in front of my house, me and a friend of mine, and uh, this other guy shows up. These two dudes get in a fight. There's a pistol involved. The guy looks like he's fixing to shoot, shoot my friend and me, so I go and get my pistol and I tell him to get off him. The guy whizzes around and comes at me. I didn't have any choice but to shoot him, so I shot him. Well, so here I am. Today, the 32-year-old convict is doing life in Robertson Prison in Abilene, Texas. And he's looking for love. Smith's personal ads showed up on one of several websites devoted exclusively to inmates. You know, I'm a kind of a southern guy, you know, and I'm looking for that kind of girl, you know. Other than that, that's about it. I put in there some of the things that I do, you know, in my off time here in prison, you know, and what I used to do in the world. but. Other than that, you know, that's about it. Just to kind of give them an idea so that the people that I would be best compatible with would write me. Inmates are denied direct access to the internet, but they are not denied access to regular mail. Adam Lovell is the president and founder of writeaprisoner.com. Our inmate population is growing in this country. And these people are very lonely. Uh, after just two years of incarceration, 80% of inmates lose 100% contact with the outside world. Basically, an inmate will send me an application, return it with a $40 check, a 250 word or less ad, and a photo. I place this information online for one year, and then people can write them directly. Prison dating is a booming business. We receive approximately 10,000 visitors a day on our website, and that is enough to support the 4,000 inmates we currently have. But by the time we're at 8,000 members, I expect to have 20,000 visitors a day on the website. Heidi Fenelon worked as a tattoo artist in Wisconsin when she discovered a prison website. Romance wasn't on her mind, at least not at first. I felt for them being in a seven by nine cell and I, and what it would feel like to be like in that situation. And so I wanted to minister to them just to give them some comfort, just to share some outside life so that they have something else to you know, think about, to look forward to a letter coming in the mail. 
Society soon connected with a convict on Florida's death row. I ran across his profile. We started off as friends. He was to the point and he said he didn't wasn't into games, head games, and he didn't come off flirty or a lot of ways the other men did. He just was real straightforward and I really appreciated that about him. But many convicts are con artists, masters at manipulating the truth. Others just want to put a clever spin on a grim reality. When Quentin Smith added sir to his name, the mail poured in. I would think that women were looking for a knight in shining armor, right? So I, that's why I put that on there. On the whole, when a woman picks a man to write to, she already has a whole set of fantasies, a lot of rescue fantasies. And uh, she's already thinking that they are in a relationship, in a sense, when she writes her first letter. Sir Quentin Smith's personal ad pulled plenty of emotional triggers. A noble son of the South. He's already trying to tell them that there are redeeming features in him, and that's what a lot of the women are looking for. They don't want to think of this person uh, as being a killer, you know, totally um, irretrievable, totally hopeless. It's hard to build relationships with people on the outside because there's very little we can do for them. So all I can do is give them companionship and ride them. In my spare time, I study history and my Bible. If killers frighten you, fear not, for this one is as gentle as a dove. That's the main line that hooks the women in, who are going to be most likely to have been disappointed with the real life men who they've dated. Men aren't the only ones promoting themselves online. At womenbehindbars.com, Female inmates post profiles and pictures free of charge. I think the women's sites are more sexually related. Men think about sex more times during the day than women do. But in order for these women to get these men to write them, I think they put that in their letters so that they feel that would get more hits or more letters coming into them. Visitors to the website pay $5 per address. It's popular enough to get about 40,000 hits a month. Between three and 4,000 women are on the site right now. Our email lists go up every week, uh, so things are looking really good for, for the website itself and, and for these women. Some ladies get a little carried away. I have to censor a lot because they'll get, they'll get very explicit as far as um, their enjoyments, per se. They talk about masturbation, they talk about sex with other men, that sort of thing. If we receive a new photo in the mail, we'll send it back and uh, with a request for a um, you know, more appropriate one. In one case, we actually had the woman uh, send a photo back that was nude, and she took black marker and drew a dress over herself. I do have a warnings page set up to what to look out for, what to notice. You know, if, if somebody's asking for nothing but money, of course, don't send any. Age can be an issue. Some people will say they're 30 when they're 35, or even 28 for that matter. Some people have lied about their race. A lot of those small stuff I, I catch before they even get online. At 23, Stephanie Barron faces life in prison for killing her parents on Christmas Day. Barron is just one of thousands of female convicts searching for friends and maybe even love. I just wanted to find other people, you know, to, to be there for me. And I seen everybody else on mail day and I decided to go ahead and, and place an ad and meet some new people and make some new friends. When you first got a letter, that very, very first time someone responded to your personal ad, what did it say and how did you feel? Well, they were just saying that I was a very beautiful girl and telling me about their self and just encouraging me to, to keep my head up and it was great, you know. Because of the amount of time I have, there's really still a lot of people out there who really care. Stephanie's best friend, Tracy Aguilera, has been behind bars since 1999 for robbery and murder. Well, when I got incarcerated, a lot of the ladies who have been here a while, um, several of them had met their husbands or people, you know, that they fell in love with and that's how they met them. So they used to always tell me about it. I'm like, I'm not placing the ad. And then when I finally did, you, you meet a lot of interesting people. You appreciate that people take time out of their lives to get in touch with you, to share a part of themselves with you. 
and get to know you as a person, even though you're in here. How do you think they're able to look beyond that? To me, I feel it takes somebody that's very open-minded and non-judgmental, where you look past all this in one situation that got a person here and see the person for what they are. Still, for prisoners of both sexes, the right photo in the right hands can push all the right buttons. The men that are the most popular on our website are definitely the guys in the best shape. Uh, the big prison bodies, they get a lot of mail. These guys have a lot of time to work out and uh, reflects in their, in their pictures. The most popular women are definitely the prettiest. Or the most famous. In July 2003, 32-year-old Susan Smith placed a personal ad on writeaprisoner.com. Nearly a decade earlier, Smith made headlines after driving her car into a lake with her two children inside. She was convicted of double homicide and sentenced to life in prison. The response to Smith's ad? Overwhelming. We estimate that she received over 6,000 email forwards alone, and that was in a 72-hour period. Uh, for postal mail, Susan Smith probably received in the tens of thousands. Whatever it was, the Department of Corrections in South Carolina felt it significant enough to do a press release on it, just to let everybody know that it's not a hoax, it is going on, and uh, she did authorize the ad. Smith described herself as kind-hearted, with a love of rainbows and Mickey Mouse. Many Americans were outraged. She has asked that her ad be removed, so in place of her address, you'll find no longer accepting letters. But her testimonial remains about the need for contact in there, uh, how everybody forgets you, how people don't forgive you, uh, how it's important to be loved. But do convicted killers deserve love? We'll dig into that debate later in the show. Up next, a best-selling author and her strange attraction to a man behind these bars. She just creates a fantasy world and then she writes about it. And that's basically, I thought at the time, her life and our life. internet has become a lifeline to the outside world. But long before there were prison dating sites, there were prison romances. In fact, we've come here to the Territorial Correctional Facility in Canyon City, Colorado to meet a bank robber once married to one of the country's best-selling authors. In 1972, Danielle Steele was a 20-something journalist when she met Danny Zugelder inside the Vacaville prison in California. Well, she was doing a freelance article, and part of the article required her to go and in interview some prison inmates. Zugelder was doing time for robbing banks. Would you say it was love at first sight? Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. yeah. And so despite her knowledge of you being a bank robber, she still pursued a relationship over the phone? When she was an upper-class socialite that was into rebelling, and she was going through a separation with her then-husband, who was a banker. So the irony of going from a banker to a bank robber, uh, she pursued me. During the next year and a half, Steele wrote to Zugelder and visited him often. She would come up on a Thursday and, and leave on Monday. And how many hours would you have together? Uh, all day, uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning until uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we had a, a great physical attraction. We would make out in the, in the visiting room. She did everything she could to help get him parole. And set him up and got him a job. And he got out, gave him a place to live. On the outside, Danny, the ex-con, didn't fit in. Was it difficult to adjust to her sort of high society life after you've been in prison for so long? Oh yeah, it was, it was really hard to adjust, you know. Uh, basically, I had the power in prison. And, and when, I, when I got out, she had all the power. It was her house, her money, uh, her expense accounts. Soon after his release, Zugelder went on a crime spree. In a week's time, he mugged and assaulted an old woman, literally around the corner from Danielle's uh, apartment. And also in that same week's time, he, uh, he raped a woman. Zugelder ended up behind bars again. So what happened next then? We would sit and talk about it in the visiting room. Hey, you know, we might as well get married. We could have conjugal visits. And so we decided to get married. 
basically for the conjugal visit. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it was, it was also it was also uh, you know a proclamation of our, of our love, of sure. course. Still, the relationship went sour. Steele filed for divorce and began seeing another felon, Bill Toth. She then wrote the book that launched her career. The novel Now and Forever wound up being a bestseller, and it was about a woman who was involved with a man who is convicted of rape and is wrongly accused and goes to prison. You know, she just creates a fantasy world, and then she writes about it, and that's basically, I thought at the time, her life and our life. Steele signed the divorce papers in April 1978. The next day, the author married Bill Toth, a recovering drug addict on parole. But Toth didn't stay clean for long. He was using again, and he got caught, and he went to prison for several years. That ended the relationship, but the love affair lived on in Daniel Steele's writing. All these books have little dark pieces of her past kind of stuck in there. You'd never know it unless you really knew her. There are plenty of other prison love stories that never made it onto the pages of a romance novel. Women from all walks of life with one thing in common. They fell for guys doing serious time. There are women who have just high school diplomas. There are women who haven't finished high school. There are women with college degrees, master's degrees, PhDs. There are professional women, lawyers. There is no one category of woman in terms of socioeconomic or educational background. When Janet Goodman's second marriage went up in flames, she swore off love and focused on her career at an aerospace company. It was really hard uh, having a very empty relationship for seven years and um, being rejected a lot um, emotionally, physically, everything was uh, I was pretty much a, a basket case at the end of that relationship. I was pretty much done with guys. Then in 1988, a co-worker invited Janet to meet her fiance, but there was a catch. She says, well, he's in prison. I was terrified, I didn't know what to expect. I just had nightmares the whole night before I didn't sleep. I thought they were all gonna be really tough and the stereotype that TV projects. Inside the visitor's room, one inmate caught Janet's eye. We just sat at separate tables. He was with his mother at their table. And, um, gosh, I kept looking at him because I thought it was very good looking. I'm just thinking, this is really weird. He just looks so normal. Uh, my first impression was he was about that gorgeous. Uh, and uh, so I was actually very uncomfortable. And then we both looked up at the same time, and it was like, wham. I can't explain that. <sighs> it was weird. The man who rocked Janet Goodman's world was also a convicted rapist. In 1983, Timothy Haynes forced a young woman into his car, tied her up, and sexually assaulted her. The very first visit, we were alone. Um, he told me what his crime was. He was, gave me all the details, um, was very honest, and he said, I have to do this, because if you choose to walk, I would like you to do it now. But Janet didn't walk. Instead, she told Haynes about her own problems. I gave him my phone number at my home. And um, I really didn't expect him to call or anything. But then he did call. And then we both just uh, talked hours and hours on end in the phones. This did not have a 20 minute time limit at that time like they do today. And we would talk from nine o'clock, sometimes till two, maybe four in the morning. I had boxes of letters. She would write every day, I'd be writing every day. We would, we joke in that it was like books, you know, these 10, 12 page letters all the time. And uh, it was wonderful. Uh, we just started talking about everything. Um, hopes, dreams, uh, everything. Because of the daily writing, 
it was like a, a journal of your emotions and your ups and downs and it, where you're at and how you're seeing small things in life. It became like a journal, I think, because uh, you share not only daily events, but then you're sharing the other parts of your life. Uh, parts that maybe you've never shared with anybody before. I began to be dependent and look forward to his calls and know that it would make my day. Within a few weeks, Janet saw Haynes as her knight in shining armor, not a dangerous felon. He gave me what no man has ever given me before. And no man out here, which is that communication and that heart connection. This man was meant for me. He was perfect. He wrote me love songs. Uh, gee, what woman doesn't like that, right? But what happens when these unlikely lovers try to turn up the heat? Not easy to do when one of them is locked up for life. More on that when THS Investigates returns. We go to the Busy Park and we're allowed to hold hands, or we're allowed to have a kiss when we, and a hug when we enter, and a kiss and a hug when we leave. anything to find love behind bars but imagine turning your life upside down for a dead man walking well that's exactly what Heidi Fenelon did when she hooked up with Carl a convicted killer who asked us not to reveal his identity I was not looking to fall in love with anyone in prison especially death row I totally did not expect this to happen in fact this devout Christian mother of two was simply trying to spread the gospel I found him on the internet. I was writing to other inmates as Christian support ministry, and I ran across his profile, and I was attracted to with his honesty that came through about his profile, so I decided to give him a try, and then I wrote him a letter, and we started off as friends. In 1984, Carl was convicted of killing a school teacher in Florida. He was sentenced to death. 18 years later, Carl and Heidi became passionate pen pals. But there was one problem. Heidi was engaged to another man. Still, she kept on writing to Carl. It just progressed into that we fell in love with each other through our letters. To me, it's really important to connect intellectually. And intellectually, he really understood me like no one else did, even my fiance. I could talk to him about ups in me and secrets in me, those, you know, those things you never tell anybody. I could tell him everything and he could tell me everything. And I really appreciated that openness and I was looking for that kind of connection in the relationship. And even though I had it to a degree with my fiance, which I liked, it was full with Carl. The couple exchanged letters for more than a year. He tells me that he lives in my sphere of love and that I make every day better for him. And he makes every day better for me too. Everything he says about me, I can say about him. I feel like I'm hugged by him throughout the day. Finally, Heidi made the 1,200 mile trip from Wisconsin to Northern Florida and Union Prison. We sat there holding hands, talking for six hours. And we were just starting to get to know each other. We were just thrilled that I was down here. It was kind of a euphoria because it was like I couldn't believe I was actually down here in Florida from Wisconsin. So we were just really, just really high off of it. At first, Heidi didn't know what to think. I wasn't sure. I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. We'll see, you know. And uh, he always said that I feel that you're a strong enough woman to do this. And I'm a very strong woman. And it takes a strong woman to survive this. Heidi returned to Wisconsin and eventually broke off her engagement. My oldest daughter wasn't thrilled about it. She wanted me with the man I was originally engaged to. My youngest daughter said, Mom, whatever makes you happy. Six months later, Heidi packed up the kids and moved to a trailer park 20 miles from the prison where Carl awaited execution. 
So what's the appeal? Why get romantically involved with someone sitting on death row? This is not a process where a woman is rational and says, well, I think I'm going to go and have a relationship with a convicted murderer. The process is different for every woman. Sometimes it's very strung out and attenuated and takes a very long time. For other women, it happens very quickly. It depends on the specific woman and the man and how charismatic he is and how f strong and powerful her need is to actually form a relationship. It's a big aphrodisiac to think that you're the center of this person's world. They can't do anything all day but think of you. It's, it's very exciting and it does make you drop your guard. From 1974 to 1978, a former Boy Scout with movie star looks and charm to match crisscrossed the country, a devious predator in search of prey. 30 young girls and women, ages 13 to 26, were raped and murdered before cops finally collared Ted Bundy. Reporters described Bundy's cold-blooded crimes in graphic detail, yet bags of fan mail arrived at his Florida jail during his trial. Ted's mail was as strange as anybody's mail could be. He got marriage proposals. Lots and lots of women sent him pictures. Some sent them nude pictures to him, um, dying for Ted to get back to them. In 1979, Bundy's trial became a public spectacle. Lovesick groupies showed up in court, desperate to attract attention. There was an assumption about Ted's victims that they all wore their hair long, parted in the middle, and wore hoop earrings. So women would come to court with their hair parted in the middle wearing hoop earrings. A couple of them even dyed their hair the right kind of brown, so they, they wanted to appeal to Ted. These are very troubled women who are in a fantasy world. They've created a fantasy out of their relationship with this man or their imagined relationship with him. Bundy married one of his admirers before a jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death. A decade later, Richard Ramirez terrorized people across California when he went on a savage killing spree. In 1988, the 28-year-old drifter stood trial. Competition for the attention of the man the media dubbed the Night Stalker was fierce. This is a guy who didn't wash, who had bad teeth, uh, you know, greasy hair. He said, I never had attention like this from women. He loved it. He had dozens of women coming to see him, writing to him, sending him gifts. And they knew about each other and they were fighting over him and, and telling him, send those other women away. Like Bundy, the Night Stalker's conviction only seemed to amp up public interest. I don't understand it. Uh, when the Night Stalker got convicted, this serial killer, he got, and still gets, bags of letters from women in the community that want to write to him and want to visit him. To most people, none of this makes any sense. But for Heidi Fenelon, her attraction to Carl was all about the person, not the crime. He's been in there 21 years, and he's not the same person he was when he was 21. He's 42 now. And that I find with most of the men in there that they're not the same person that they were, whether innocent or guilty, when they were arrested. These women would not say, I love a killer. They say, I love a man who's behind bars, he's serving a life sentence for murder, but he's a different person now. He's certainly not a killer. The system convicted him, and maybe he did pull the trigger, but there were extenuating circumstances, and he should not have been convicted. So there's a measure of denial. Sex is also denied on death row. Conjugal visits are forbidden. I've had enough sex for two year, lifetimes, so I realized I seriously thought about all these things. And it's like, okay, I can do this. I can do this for love. So what does love have to do with it? For Heidi and countless other women, the answer is simple. Everything. When THS investigates returns, till death do us part. He proposed and I probably hesitated for about 10 seconds at the most and then said, oh yes. And still to come, wounds that cut so deep they never heal. 
the man who had murdered my father was on one of these websites and he was holding a nice fluffy little kitty and it was very, very disturbing. THS investigates love behind bars. You met Veronica Compton earlier in our show. Back in 1980, Veronica made a pact with the devil and the judge threw the book at her. She got life in prison for attempted murder. Compton was only 22 at the time and life as she knew it was over. Veronica regretted every moment of her strange and violent encounter with hillside strangler Kenneth Bianchi. But after eight years behind bars, Veronica and another inmate managed to escape from the Washington Women's Prison. They were caught 10 days later in Tucson, Arizona. I knew that she had someone on the outside and they had actually cut a hole in a fence. And she had somehow gotten out, snuck out of the building, and had gotten out of the grounds and was able to get out in that fashion. Compton's short run at freedom cost her more prison time and she settled in for the long haul. Veronica poured over law journals and spoke out about changes needed in the prison system. In 1987, she began corresponding with a respected 57-year-old college professor and published author named James. One thing led to another. She began to express what was obviously more than merely platonic interest, and uh, I found that I was responding to this. And I said, well, well when she first told me what crime she'd committed. Good Lord. One of the questions in my mind was, am I really just simply dealing with somebody who is deranged? But she wasn't. What was the attraction then? James liked the law, Veronica liked the law. The bond grew. One year later, the professor moved inmate number 276077 to the head of the class. He proposed and I probably hesitated for about 10 seconds at the most and then said, oh, yes. It was one of the happiest moments of my life. So was August 17th, 1989. Inside the prison chapel, Veronica and James exchanged vows. <laughs> Veronica planned the entire ceremony from her cell. She wore a wedding dress ordered through the mail. 50 fellow inmates attended. There were quite a few of the girls there, and uh, they all wanted bouquets that she would throw. <laughs> oh, it was fun. Uh, you know, it, it, it had its farcical qualities because there were only certain things you could do. You could only be in certain areas, and uh, we could only have a certain amount of physical contact, not very much, and a very limited time. It was kind of bittersweet because we weren't able to have a conjugal visit after the ceremony. It was beautiful but very sad because I was going to go back to my cell and he was going to go back to an empty home. And that was an ache. Veronica and her new husband consummated their marriage in a prison trailer three months later. Conjugal visits are um, ruled by policy. They're very hard to get. You have to be a model prisoner. You have to have um, psychiatric testing and clearance by the mental health. You've got to also um, have physicals and make sure that you don't have any kind of disease that you could spread to your mate. The trailer is um, very much like a standard small apartment. They don't have any hard utensils though. The newlyweds spent 48 hours together at first, it was tough for Veronica. Early memories came flooding back. The loneliness, the desperation, the sexual abuse. I felt like I was a virgin. I was timid and scared and trembling. I had a problem being um, touched and because of the flashbacks. And um, he worked with me through that. Four years and dozens of conjugal visits later, Veronica and James received some surprising news. I got pregnant, and we did not expect it. We did not want it. When it happened, we were great. I mean, you know, it's an act of God. 
On September 17, 1993, 36-year-old Veronica gave birth behind bars to a baby girl, Juliet. There we go. Look at that face. Just look at that. But mother and daughter had little time to bond. She was only with me um, after her birth for 20 hours. Ms. Julia arrived, and uh, her grandmother took her for the first 10 weeks. But I still remember when I packed her into the car, <laughs> I was scared to death. I went through this kind of blind um, obsession where I could not stop thinking about her. Is she being kissed? Is she being warm enough? You know, is she comfortable? Is someone cooing with her? Is someone <gasps> loving her? And um, that's so hard. It was a lot harder on Veronica than it was on me. I was, after all, I was out free. And not nearly so bad as for Juliet because, you know, she'd meet her mother and then we'd go away again. And uh, that was difficult for her. Veronica remained a model prisoner, and nine years later, she was paroled. In 2003, after 23 years in prison, Veronica finally came home to her husband and daughter. Love you. Give her a smack. Vows are exchanged here at San Quentin an average of 10 times a year. Across the nation, the number of prison weddings totals more than 400 annually. Yet the most bizarre of all marriages involving a prisoner didn't happen behind bars. In 1980, 32-year-old Carol Ann Boone took the stand as a character witness during the trial of serial killer Ted Bundy. Bundy mocked the court and the entire judicial system by acting as his own attorney. He asked one very direct question of his number one fan. Carol, do you want to marry me? Yes. And I want to marry you? Yes. And I do want to marry you? <laughs> he said you did. He had taken advantage of uh, ancient law in the books that s talks about, it, you know, that you can do this in a courtroom and then you're pronounced married. So he proposed to her, she accepted, giggling in the middle of, you know, them trying to decide if he's going to die. He did. Ted Bundy was put to death in the electric chair in 1989 at age 42. Turn on the bird. <laughs> to this question of whether or not she really believed he was innocent, she did have a child by him, uh, conceived behind a water cooler in the visitor's park at Florida State Prison. Boone claimed Bundy fathered her baby girl, though that remains in dispute. Meanwhile, Night Stalker Richard Ramirez awaited trial in Los Angeles. Over a three-year period, he received more than 70 fan letters from 41-year-old Doreen Leoy. Ramirez was convicted in 1989 and sentenced to death. But that didn't stop him from marrying Leoy inside San Quentin seven years later. Ramirez still sits on death row, where his wife visits him often. And very, very proud to have married Richard and to be his wife. In 1988, Executive Secretary Janet Goodman and convicted rapist Timothy Haynes decided to set a wedding date just four months after they met. I'm thinking, how do I come to this? You know what, I mean, how, I mean, this is like really crazy. I mean, this man in prison that can offer me no income assistance, I don't care about all that stuff. He gave me what no man has ever given me before, which is that communication and that heart connection. But planning a prison wedding is nothing like planning a conventional wedding. You have to account for every pen and every corsage. Everything has to be inventoried and approved and on a list, and then they check it all through the scanners. You leave the penitentiary for X amount of time, and at that moment, the penitentiary didn't exist. It was just, it was just Dan and I right there. He was who I should have married to start with. It was everything I ever dreamed of, and it was very difficult to leave. In 2004, Heidi Fenelon made plans to marry her man, a convicted killer on death row. 
I decided that Carl was worth it because he was everything I was looking for in a man. I think nowadays a lot of people look, what can the other person give me? What do they have to offer materialistically in a relationship? Well, I didn't need that and I can take care of myself. So what I was looking for was understanding, a connection with the mind and the heart, and he just fits it all. Physical separation is the biggest challenge every jailhouse couple faces. The one thing that these relationships lack is that the woman has to turn back and watch you go beyond the bars. They have to go back to their home and sit on the couch and watch that movie by themselves. They have to go to bed by themselves. It took me a few months to really get adjusted to that. I was having, it was a little rough, like, oh, I only get to see him once a week. And one problem never goes away. I'm in prison. Why would you want to stay with somebody who's locked up? And didn't earn for money. <laughs> and um, so it, um, I had none. The reality of separation hit Janet especially hard in 1992. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. Yeah, I mean, that just... It ate us alive or ate me alive at that point, you know, because you want to throw it away. You get a diagnosis where she's got six months to a year to live, and that's not exactly a happy time, you know. You're scared to death, and you can't even be there to hold her through the chemo or, or the, the operations. You can't even hold her hand be there in the recovery room. The commitment is, was for better or for worse. Um, till death do you part. So why would, if you receive everything, except his presence there every day. But you get everything that that presence you didn't have with someone else. Why would I give that up, regardless if he ever comes home? Janet Haynes won her battle with cancer, and she remains committed to her husband. This prison relationship works, but most don't. More on that when THS Investigates returns. I'm very skeptical. Do people like that really change? Do they really stop the thoughts and the obsessions? Welcome back to THS Investigates Love Behind Bars. Men and women from all walks of life are reaching out to prisoners on the internet and many inmates can't wait. Jailhouse romances and marriages are on the rise, and so are the con games. It might surprise some people there's criminals in here. So if you, if you allow yourself to come into this environment and you're not careful, you're liable to run into somebody who's trying to uh, get you to send them packages. And uh, uh, those don't last very long. Anybody with any integrity is going to go, you know what? I'm not getting any, you know, any uh, reciprocal contribution here. You know, you're not giving me anything. Well, I knew this one guy. Um, um, he's not, he's not here on this unit anymore. But uh, he had this picture of this real buff bodybuilder guy, right? And his, that was a photograph he'd send to this. Of course, he's this old man. And he, he sent this picture of this dude. Say, oh, yes, this is me. I'm getting out next month. <laughs> you know, they would send him money and he would ask him for money, a little commissary money and they would send you money and stuff and he had a bunch of them that he was doing pretty good. I would warn anybody, you don't want to be coming into this environment uh, and just arbitrarily just trusting, you know, and, and I would tell people to be very leery. Unfortunately there are the hustlers and some of the games that I know of are the women that take photographs of other women that are attractive and they put them on the internet. They pretend to be the person in the photograph. The men that respond solely based on a woman's looks, I think get what they want, which is a sexual connection. And in exchange for that, they're willing to pay money. Yet sometimes the cons get conned. There's been a few times that I found out that they're writing the same person in, in the dorm with me. You know, a lot of men write several different women and tell them the same things. One guy that I, I had thought that I was really getting into, he was actually also writing somebody else in my dorm and I found out. Yet despite the obstacles, some inmates do find happiness. 
For Veronica Compton, reaching that point meant surviving 23 years in jail. Today, Veronica enjoys her freedom and her family. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, you know, that um, we managed through those hard times, and uh, we now are together, and it is so wonderful, and we have a life, a real life, and a real family, and we deal with all the struggles that every other family deals with. Except that this family finds it hard to be normal. I would like them to just forget us all. The best thing you can have in life, believe me, is not 15 minutes of celebrity. It's a lifetime of anonymity. I put the past in the past where it belongs. And I strive to make each day a good day for everybody that touches my world or any world that I touch, to touch it gently and with love. That's all I can do. For those still serving time, like Stephanie Barron, contact with people on the outside becomes a lifeline. What I can actually get is a peace of mind, an escape from the negativity, just trying to remain outside of here. You know, it, it gets hard dealing with the amount of time that I have. Stephanie's friend Tracy Aguilera is also doing hard time for robbing and killing an elderly man. There's days where you feel like you're just completely going to be alone, you know, and I mean, that, that bothers you, you know, and there's nights where you might lie there and cry yourself to sleep because you miss that. The people that take the time out to reach out to the people in here, um, I think they should know how much it means to the people in here. They, they really help them. They, they help encourage them, and, and they, they help them not give up. There are very few programs in prison to actually rehabilitate inmates, so we just sort of punish them, and then when they're done, if they are done, throw them out in the streets and say, you know, make your own way. So I think anything that helps rehabilitate a prisoner is good. I'm very skeptical. Do people like that really change? Do they really stop the thoughts? and the obsessions, does that really happen? Convicted rapist Timothy Haynes has been locked up for 26 years. So far, his appeals to the parole board have all been denied. It's easier doing time by yourself. It really is, because you're not as concerned uh, with family and people in there if you're all alone. Yet at the same time, there's the other side of the coin. Prison can be the most destructive place that you've ever seen in your life. And having that person that is there to talk to, mm -hmm. that give you, gives the hope and the strength to keep going on every day. Mm -hmm. Because there's days you don't want to do this. And it's a reminder of the better things in life. Haynes and his wife Janet were married in 1988. They hope to one day live together. He's also asked me questions, what will you do if you wake up and I'm not there and you find me in the bathroom, because that's the smallest room in the house and that's what I'm used to. I said, well, okay, I'll grab a cup of coffee and we'll come get a sit and we'll talk. We talk about every fear. We have no fear of talking about anything. And if he has one, then we talk about it. It's not a normal loving relationship because both people are starting the relationship from points of desperation. The person behind bars is obviously desperate, and the person who is looking for love behind bars is desperate because they feel as though they can't find it in their real life. Brian Smith is serving life at San Quentin for his part in a gang-related killing. Smith keeps to himself. I'm not pursuing a relationship right now because of the uncertainty of my future. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to parole. I would like to think that I'm paroling within a year, uh, but that's not guaranteed. And uh, just as my personal opinion, I don't think it would be fair to bring that uncertainty to a relationship. For Heidi and her fiancé, Carl, till death do us part takes on a whole new meaning. Carl sits on death row and time is running out. The possible execution of him always is in the back of your mind. It's in both of our minds, but you don't dwell on it. It's not over till it's over. And 
Sometimes I go through, um, I used to go through feeling really sad about that. And I know that if the time came, it would be horrific for me. But I know it's not legally allowed, but I'd love to hold his hand if that ever happens because my love is, is eternal for him. Is Heidi Fenelon a selfless humanitarian or a lonely woman desperate for love? And what about the bigger debate? Should convicted killers be allowed contact with the outside world or do we just lock the cell door and throw away the key? We'll examine the controversy over prisoner rights when THS Investigates returns. He projected himself as this warm and lovable, likable person, and he had chosen to crush my father's skull. Every year, more and more inmates reach beyond prison walls to find friendship, love, and even marriage. But should these criminals, especially those convicted of violent acts like rape and murder, be allowed contact with the outside? What about the victims and their families? Isolation from society and being excluded from society is part of the price they should pay for having committed a crime. In May 1995, Jennifer Johnson Martinez lost her father to a drug-crazed murderer. 58-year-old music teacher Roy Johnson was kidnapped and bludgeoned to death near Tucson, Arizona. The cops arrested Bo Green, an admitted crystal meth addict, for the crime. Green was convicted and sentenced to death. The defendant, Bo John Green, has been found guilty and put to death in the manner prescribed. But for the Johnson family, the ordeal didn't end with the verdict. It was really upsetting to me to see him on the internet because he projected himself as this warm and lovable, likable person and he had chosen to crush my father's skull. That I actually downloaded his picture here at work and I threw it on the floor and I actually stomped on it. <laughs> but that's because it was, it was very upsetting at the time. In fact, the image was so disturbing that Jennifer's mother took action. In 2000, Stardust Johnson testified in support of Arizona state law HB 2376. The legislation had several provisions, including one that made it illegal for inmates to post personal ads. I was very angry, very angry that he should be up on the internet trying to engage women in relationships when my husband was dead because he murdered him. He beat my husband to death. My husband, who was professor of music at the University of Arizona, who was this kind and loving human being, I think death row is an appropriate place for him, and um, I will be glad when he finally exhausts all of his appeals. Jennifer, an attorney with the Arizona State Legislature, worked tirelessly to help pass the legislation. In July 2000, HB 2376 finally became law. There's so much greater exposure through the internet than through a pen pal type relationship. I know that most of these prisoners really are not good people and tend to be master manipulators. And a lot of people might be accessing these sites, particularly young children but they may not really be aware of what they might be exposing themselves to in terms of potential harm. However, in December 2002, the Arizona Supreme Court overturned the law, ruling that it violated the First Amendment rights of prisoners. Judges have since dismissed similar laws in other states. Well, it is unfortunate that a lot of these people are in for violent crimes. Most aren't, but some are. A lot of people have that lock them up and throw them away mentality. And uh, with death row inmates, that's even more the case. Uh, they aren't going to be coming out. But if an American citizen wants to correspond with an inmate on death row, that's their right. And it's actually still the inmate's right to do it. The debate over prisoner rights involves some of the most powerful and vocal public interest groups in the country. Yet even some supporters of the death penalty believe inmates deserve access to the outside world. It's clearly to our benefit from a program standpoint and from a security standpoint to have men living here who 
are more comfortable with, with their environment. And let me say that it's not a very comfortable environment to begin with. I don't consider letters or an occasional visit to be anything that an inmate should be prevented from getting. And maintaining some element of contact allows them to, uh, to retain their hope and to feel that their life does have some worth and value. But don't tell that to the families of murder victims. You may think you're lonely and you want to reach out to somebody. No matter how well-intentioned you are, they may be beyond reformation if that's what your goal is. And if your goal is a loving relationship, then and maybe you don't want to start looking for a loving relationship with a prisoner. Ten years after the brutal slaying of her husband, the pain is still real for Stardust Johnson. Until tomorrow, I love you. I was dead in many ways, uh, totally devastated by the loss of this human being who um, was more than my other half. He was everything to me, and I thought he was wonderful. I still do. And a bit of human filth murdered him for no reason except that he wanted his car and his money. Bo Green remains on death row. No date has been set for his execution. Which brings us back to where we began our story, here at San Quentin, with another death row inmate, Scott Peterson. What I would say to those people that are writing uh, Peterson is look at yourself, really be honest with yourself. Why are you putting yourself in this situation to be victimized? What, what is it inside of you that's making you hate yourself enough to hurt yourself like this? Because it is self-destruction, and it's going to be nothing but disgrace and shame for you. So stop it now and start loving yourself. Don't throw your heart away on someone like that. He made his bed. Let him lie in it. It's not your problem. Powerful words from a woman who's been there. I'm Samantha Harris. Thanks for joining us on THS Investigates Love Behind Bars. Is that correct, Mr. Peterson? You're pleading not guilty of the two charges of uh, murder plus the special, uh, denying the special allegations. That's correct, Your Honor. I'm innocent. Senator, please step forward. Don't shake your finger at me, young man. Don't shake your finger at me, young man. All right. It's real easy. Yeah. What you understand is this one I killed. These two I don't know about. 